folks, welcome back inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is hour number two of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk 1210. Please go to powertalk1210.com, download our app, free app, and be able to stream all of our live shows as we are now full extraterrestrial radio all over the world. And I um, <clears throat> just want to give a shout out here to Mike Soma Villa for uh, setting this interview up. And without further ado... I want to bring in a really talented multi-instrumentalist, a guy that goes back to the days of Bill Monroe uh, and the Bluegrass Boys. At least that's what he came up with. And then he became part of the Youngbloods with Jesse Colin Young and has continued to inspire as a hang glider, as a, as a guy fusing Apple computers and doing all sorts of inventive work and still keeping the spirit, the spiritual qualities of music alive banana lowell levenger welcome to the jake feinberg show thank you so much uh banana i wanted to um talk to you about a cat uh, one cat I, I interviewed him a year ago and i'm so glad i did um because he's left us now can you talk about playing your personal and professional relationship with bill keith well, I met him in 1962 in cambridge when i uh, was just uh becoming a bluegrass musician and uh, going to Boston University. And then I dropped out of Boston University and uh, dropped into the whole folk scene there. It was the, the era that we call the folk scare in the early 60s. And it was kind of happening in the Boston, Cambridge area and New York and uh, Berkeley and San Francisco all at the same time. And Bill Keith uh, was playing at the Club 47 with Jim Rooney in those days, and I was also managed to get wheedle my way into the Club 47 uh, with my little bluegrass group, Banana and the Bunch, Old Time Music with Appeal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I used to, uh, and I, I ran some hoots at the Club 47 on Sundays, too. They had hoot nannies, and I would uh, MC those sometimes. Anyway, so I got to know uh, Bill Keith, and of course, he was an amazing banjo player, and I was not such an amazing banjo player, but he let me sit at his feet and absorb everything that he was doing, and when I had questions, he would answer them, and when I had come up with a cool little tune, he would listen to it and think it was great and improve it, and uh, so we got to be friends, and uh, he was just a huge influence on my musical life. I was going to say, because when, uh, when he joined the uh, Jim Queskin Jug Band, uh, they were out at the uh, Troubadour, a place I'm sure Banana was peeling away at at some point in your career, and he uh, and who was in the audience but Duke Ellington. And Duke came backstage after the gig, and what he was marveling at was Bill's pedal steel. And the uh, w I think M Maria told me, you know, what was going through Duke's mind was all the, the harmonic uh, possibilities with a pedal steel a guitar, um, which was fascinating, you know, coming from the, a, a legend of jazz. But um, <clears throat> um, I am all, by the way, I didn't drop out, but, you know, I went, I went to, Bo I graduated from Boston University, too, uh, with a degree. Yeah, in, I saw that. <laughs> uh, you know, 96 to 2000. I never graduated. <laughs> you never did, but, you you know, things, things, things worked out for you. I, you know, you, but I'm trying to get this, the chron chronology straight. You were born on the East Coast or on the West Coast? No, yeah, I was born. I'm a native New Yorker. So you're <laughs> and where, where, from the city or, or where, whereabouts? Yeah, I was born, born in Manhattan on Women's Hospital in Lexington Avenue. So, um, but then you were, uh, and then you, and then you went to BU from there. That's is that correct? Or well, no, I went to. So we moved to California when I was about three, and I was actually raised in uh, Santa Rosa, California, which is about an hour north of San Francisco. And, uh, well, I would the, the question yet because this is what I wanted to talk about. You you got infatuated. It was kind of right around the freeform radio was really coming into bloom, and you were listening to cats, uh, whether you knew it or not. Uh, you know, uh, African American uh, blues artists. But uh, I wanted you to talk about how that kind of stretched your mind and also your ears. Well, er, you know, when I was ever since I can remember, music has been running through my head. And my mother played the piano and was a piano teacher and a concert pianist, and so we always had a piano in our house. And as soon as I could reach up high enough to hit the keys, I started plunking on them. And uh, 
you know, some combinations didn't sound so good and other combinations sounded a little better. You try to remember those. <laughs> and then, you know, as I got older, I started taking lessons and all that stuff. And uh, But listening to the radio in those days, we're talking early 50s, uh, it was pretty bleak until you managed to discover the race stations over in the East Bay that were playing all this rhythm and blues and blues, or the country stations that only came in late at night uh, that were playing Hank Williams and uh, Lefty Frizzell and all this, you know, other cool stuff. So that, I mean, I, I, uh, I loved Gilbert and Sullivan, and I liked classical music pretty well, but I didn't much like what was going on in the hit parade uh, in the 50s. It was just so schmaltzy and vanilla and vapid. So all this other stuff just grabbed me, grabbed my heart, grabbed my imagination, and kind of informed my whole musical frame of reference. And uh, that's the kind of stuff, you know, that I started trying to learn how to play. Can you talk about, um, can you talk about an, uh, some kind of fantasy that you had in your imagination, in your mind at that time? Um, hmm. I wonder what kind of fantasies I had in my mind. I mean, I was just kind of doing it. When, when I was about 11, I started playing piano with a, a local doo-wop group, a street singing group in Santa Rosa. And then when I was about 12 or 13, I fell in with some jazz guys, Dan Hicks among them. And, really? Uh, wow. Dan Hicks? So yeah, I, so I, yeah, I've known him since I was about 13 years old. I love he this. Was, but he was playing jazz? I mean, was it like Dixieland jazz? Yeah, yeah, he was a jazz drummer back in those Holy days. And cow. I was a piano player, and we had this guy, Jeff Johnson, playing guitar, and Wayne Whitaker playing saxophone. And, uh, yeah, we tried to play jazz. <laughs> this is, wait, hold, I gotta get. Were, were you, were you, were you, were you playing like? Pretty funny, were you playing you know, bebop? Were you playing heck? bebop or 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 Dixieland or what? Uh, you, you know, take the A train at the Ellington. Scott, I love you know, this. I love that classes. banana. I love this. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> this is great. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. So I always I, I had dreams of becoming a musician, but actually, my main fantasies back then were to be. I wanted to be a comedic actor or a comedian. I read all the books. All the the. the uh, biographies of Bob Hope and uh, Jack Benny and the Marx Brothers and all that stuff. I just love comedy and all the way back, you know, to vaudeville and burlesque and stuff. I just adored it. And so when I went, when I went to Boston University, I went to the School of Fine and Applied Arts in the theater division and I wanted to be an actor. Uh, but, you know, I also was a musician and uh, when I approached them, the dean of men, who was new that sec I was in my second year about uh, wanting to go part time because I was playing gigs at night with this little bluegrass man, and uh, but I still wanted to be an actor. And he said, "Ow, wow, wow, wow. you need one hundred percent of your attention focused on the theater, or you will never make it. We need your complete devotion." On and on like that, and uh, I'd had deportment problems all through my educational career. And once again, they reared their ugly heads, and my third finger came up, and I walked out of the room, and that ended my college career. So, so much for being an actor, I was a musician. Did you... Um, oh, yeah, fantasies as a kid, I guess, were being an actor, but I also always wanted wanted to play. When the when that little, uh, what were they called, the Shandells, I think, uh, the little street singing group, they actually got a deal, and they got to go to L.A. and make a record, but I was only 12, so I couldn't go with them. <laughs> Did you... Um, I'm just curious. I know you went to Club 47, and you know it was Peter Rowan, and it was it was Moldauer, and you know those cats, Queskin, uh, and the guy that played the wash tub bass, uh, uh, Fritz. Fritz Richmond, and I, you know I've chronicled, I've interviewed all those. I, I stole Fritz Richmond's girlfriend away from him and married her and had seven kids with her. Seven. Yeah. How's that? That's badass. <laughs> I, 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 Fritz Richmond, uh, rest in peace. The question is, did you know Wavy Gravy at that time? Not at that time. I didn't meet Wavy until we moved out to the West Coast. Okay, because he was he was playing he was doing beat poetry with a in with the village, yeah. Well, no, uh, in Boston. What? In Boston, he went to Boston University huh. at the same time that you did. Well, I wasn't even aware. This is in we're talking sixty two, sixty three. Oh, you better believe it, buddy. I, feel, I think he went sixty, sixty one, and he was over in. At a, and, and I'll get you, I'll transcribe, I think I already transcribed it, but I, uh, he was at a club doing beat poetry with, uh, I think, an upright bass, vibes, and a, dr and a drum, and a trap set. 
And and there you are in Cambridge on the other side after giving the middle finger to uh, your theater instructor. Um, but 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 you know, uh, banana. Can you you know like I I really enjoy um, your you, you know the, the 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 albums that I listen to the Young Bloods albums. You're, you're you're playing all sorts of different instruments. Uh, you know, I've never heard you. Your your solos are all pretty refined. Um, you have very nice control, a nice sequencing of ideas. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, uh, speaking of the beat poets, uh, Ber- Ferlin Getty, Lord Buckley, Ginsburg, uh, Kerouac. Where did, how much did they inspire you as an artist, if, if anything? And did you get to see them perform live? You could talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, they informed me, I think, you know, more, more as a person <laughs> than as an artist. When I was uh, in, in Santa Rosa, growing up in Santa Rosa in junior high and high school, it was, was kind of the, the height of the beat, or our perception. It was probably the end of it, really, but it was we were kind of gonging in on the, uh, the end of the beat generation in San Francisco, and we would go to the City Lights bookstore. And I always hung out with older kids. So when I was like 13, I was hanging out with 16-year-olds who could drive. <laughs> and uh, so we went to... North Beach, and we listened to their bongos and poetry and went to the City Lights bookstore and scored matchboxes, matchboxes full of pot for five bucks. And uh, and then there was this coffee house in Santa Rosa called the Bottega Coffee House, where instead of going to classes, I would go and hang out and drink coffee and read these guys and read you know, Kafka and Nietzsche and all this weird stuff and try to be a beatnik um, and listen to jazz. Um so uh, yeah, they they you know they were a big influence on my uh, adolescence and uh, probably you know pseudo rebellious nature and curiosity and liking to read and all that stuff. I mean, did they did they did you feel more emboldened as an artist to express yourself based off of their sort of firebrand way of saying there's an alternative way to lead life and we're going to show you that way. Hmm. I don't know. I, I, I've never been the victim of any reluctance to express myself in the first. Well, that's good. No, so you were just, you were just basically trying to be, you were just trying to be a poser. But yeah, I, 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 I dig, I dig. Um, uh, what, and, and so, and can you talk about your first, uh, transcendent experience, uh, on LSD? Hmm. I guess it must have been in Cambridge, and what the actual first one was, or just one that comes to Boy, mind. Darn, darn if I can remember. Yeah, I mean, just just one just one, one that been. we had an apartment yeah. in Cambridge, uh, Michael Kane and Rick Turner and I, and uh, we uh, we had met Michael Kane and Rick Turner and I met the very first day at Boston University at uh, the orientation where they sent all the freshmen, 5,000 of them, out to <laughs> this uh, resort in Swampscott on the North Shore for orientation. And they issued everyone beanies <laughs> that were mandatory <laughs> to wear. And three kids out of this whole group of kids refused to wear the beanie. And it was Michael Kane, Rick Turner, and me, who had never met each other before in our lives, but we gravitated together <laughs> And discovered that all of us were real familiar with Lead Belly and Woody Guthrie and Odetta and Brown, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee and Pete Seeger and the blues and all that. We all shared this common, we were all musicians and we all shared this common musical background and we were damned if we were going to wear these fucking beanies. Uh, <laughs> I love it. So we hit it off right away and we're still all good friends to this very day and that was the basis of Banana and the Bunch, old time music of, with appeal. And um, so uh, anyway, so now we're fat. Now we fast forward. And what was the question again? The, the, no, so 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 you, you guys are, are, are oh, LSD, right? So we yeah, had right, this, right. this apart. We we became friends. Uh, we Michael and I dropped out first, and and Rick lasted to the end of the year. He thought he was he was an English major and felt all these obligations to his parents. He'd grown up in Marblehead and could you know come through and get this education like was expected of him and everything. So we had dropped out halfway through the second year, Michael and I, to 
be musicians, and he was you know, a musician too. And also, he's turned out to be an incredible luthier. In fact, I think he's coming over later this afternoon. Hmm. Anyway, um, uh, so we had this apartment together in Cambridge. Oh, he, and so he finally dropped out. He made it till the end of that year. And then when it came time for, to take his finals, the week of finals, the start of the week, he crawled into the bathtub and refused to get out. And that's how he spent his finals week, stoned in the bathtub. <laughs> uh, right, right. Uh, but I mean, so uh, yeah. uh, we managed to somehow or other, I can't remember how, get a connection to get this stuff shipped from us out from California from uh, Owsley and Associates. Right. And uh, it came in these uh, burettes. Uh, is that what they're called? I think uh, glass, little skinny little glass tubes. Sure. And you break off the end of them, and then you try to keep track of how many of these little, theoretically, uh, each drop is the same. I doubt that drops that you're putting on these sugar cubes. Right, right. Well, jeez, right. I mean, the stuff, just the fumes, and the stuff gets absorbed into your skin, and, you know, after a few hours of trying to do this, the sugar cubes are floating around, <laughs> and the stuff is all <laughs> over the place. But anyway, so that's what we were up to. Um, and I can't really mem- remember the first time, but I can remember floating around, and I can remember, you know, looking at death in different ways, and thinking of great stuff to play and seeing all the colors and uh, laughing so hard. You know, your cheeks and your stomach would hurt so hard from laughing. And um, what, was your, what, was, what was your experience like playing music on LSD? Um, you came up with some pretty, I hope, yeah, well, there are recordings, so the improvisations actually are pretty good. Um, I think it kind of depends, though, you know, on your training and your education and your musical background the 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 oeuvre that you're going to draw from when you, that was created probably when you weren't stoned <laughs> right. for all these years right uh, if you have that to draw from I think your improvisations make sense and aren't as boring or elongated as some of the improvisations that may be created by people who don't have as rich a musical background you know what I mean well I I just first of all can you point to anything on record where you know for a fact that because there's so much young blood stuff with with you with the trio where it stretches out is there anything that you can point to that you guys were you were tripping out when you played it probably the rock festival stuff mm-hmm. on that sec- on that live album i bet mm-hmm. and and uh um i, I that, that you just led into a beautiful question here i mean but i will point out that it was only joe and i who were who were stone and acid jesse didn't drink acid by the way or smoke pot, or do any of that. Jesse stuff. was straight ahead. Um, yeah. The question is this. Um, well, first of all, just first of all, uh, I always considered uh, Spencer Dryden and Billy Kreutzmann and I and Gregor Rico, uh, Michael Shree, uh, and I'm uh, Garibaldi as well. Uh, there's other cats too. This cat Bauer was he considered at one point the best drummer in the Bay Area? Well, he's uh, is the most melodic. I mean, you know, I, I mean, could tell me how he, that he certainly wasn't the most powerful. If you put him, I'm not interested in power. Chair, you'd never hear. No, I, I want the 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 the, 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 the country <laughs> thunder. This ridiculous uh, gliding. I mean, to me, man, you guys had it that that you were gliding. But to, how did you meet Bauer? That that dude is swinging his ass off. He, uh, well, we were we were had this apartment in Cambridge and. Uh, downstairs from we had the uh, second floor and it was a two-story place and downstairs from us was a person named diana Dew, who uh later reached fame by being the inventor of the first electric dress a dress that had wow. bulbs sewn into it and was powered by batteries wow. anyway wow. she was from memphis <laughs> joe was also from memphis and they had been good friends when they had both been growing up in memphis Joe had, was this great drummer and decided he wanted, and he was also a jazz a jazz guy. So he made the big move, took the big chance, went to New York to try to get work and make it as a jazz drummer. I don't know how long he was there, but, you know, in 1964 or 5 or whatever it was, 65, I guess, he uh, rolled into Cambridge, you know, licking his wounds with his tail between his legs, dragging his drum set. <laughs> <laughs> escaping from New York mm-hmm. and moved in with Diana Dew downstairs from us. 
so uh, we met him and, and got to be friends. And uh, But he practiced all the time. You know, we were just folkies playing guitars and mandolins and banjos and stuff. And here's this jazz drummer downstairs practicing all the time. So when Jerry and Jesse decided that they wanted to start a folk rock band and... Uh, they had this, uh, and, and then they got uh, Jim Mears, who lived up the street and was a guitar player. They convinced him to buy an electric bass and play bass with them. And then they, they wanted a drummer. And we said, oh, we got the greatest drummer in the world living downstairs. We'll just take him with you. They had this gig in Toronto for two weeks or three weeks or something. So whew, they took Joe, and there was no drummer practicing downstairs for a couple of years. <laughs> and then when they came back, um, they took Joe with them to New York. And then a few weeks later, they talked me into coming to New York. <laughs> was that was that hard to convince you? I mean, wh can you talk about uh, you know coming into? I had this. We we had this group. You know, so I was you know, living with Michael Caney, and Rick and Michael and I had this group, the Trolls, which was a uh, sort of a rhythm and blues band, a rock blues rock band in Cambridge, and. Uh, and we had been through different lead singers and lead guitarists and whatnot, and I had played the role of all of this off and on. And uh, yeah, it really wasn't going anywhere. But um, And we had caused a lot of consternation in the folk world, going to folk festivals and playing electric and stuff like that. That was fun. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, so one night, it's like two in the morning, and uh, Gary Corbett wakes, shakes me awake out of a sound sleep and says, Banana, banana, you got to come to New York and join our group. We're doing great. We got this really cool gig at Gertie's Folk City, and it looks like we're going to get a record contract, and, and you know, everything's going great. And what we need is you playing electric piano. And I said, you know, well, that's cool, except that I don't have an electric piano. Right. Although I'd always dreamed, ever since I heard what I said, I'd always wanted a Wurlitz or electric piano and, and to play one. He said, don't worry about it. I've already talked to Briggs, and he he's selling his and getting something else. He'll sell you his, elect his Wurlitz or piano, Briggs of uh, Burying the Remains. And uh, so I said, okay. Because really, you know, there wasn't just wasn't much happening. I mean, I felt bad about abandoning my bandmates in in Boston, but uh, this just looked like, you know, probably a better <laughs> better possibility than what was happening for me there. So, I bought Briggs's piano, went to New York. And they had this gig at Gertie's Folk City. They were calling themselves Jesse Cullen Young and the Jerry Corbett Three, and they had Joe and Jim Mears, and uh, Jerry and Jesse. So meanwhile, the stage at Gertie's Folk City, they barely fit on. No way was I going to fit on there with my super reverb and my um, Wurlitzer electric piano. <laughs> and then I brought a guitar too, of course. You didn't have a and, you didn't have a Hammond uh, you didn't have a Hammond B3 with a with a Leslie. Speed. No, no, I've never owned a Hammond B3. Okay, good. Go ahead. I dreamed of having a, a, a sedan delivery, you know, like a 1953 Chevy. Oh sedan yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, I was born and in seventy. You refit it with a with the rig from a hearse that slide out, the coffin slides out and lowers down, you know. And you use that for your B3. Absolutely. Right? No, listen, B3. man. Richard Groove Holmes, those cats, they, they used to rent hearsts to get around upstate New York to get the B3 <laughs> in there. So, uh, you know. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, no room for me on the stage. So, I set up my piano in the booth next to the stage and uh, played the gig from there. And then when they heard my super reverb, they all had these crappy little amps. I don't know why Heath kids or something. <laughs> And um, they said, okay, well, we we're going to run the vocals through your amp in addition to your guitar and your piano. So I was playing from a booth next to the stage, uh, and my amp was the sound system. Wonder. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's unbelievable. That was my first gig with them. Then we, you know, things developed, and we uh, decided to change the name to the Youngbloods, and off we went. Did you... Uh uh, cross paths with uh, David Dog Grisman at that point. I had briefly crossed paths with him back in, in you know in the folk world back in Boston ever so briefly, but uh, I didn't really get to know him until we moved out here. Can you talk about your relationship with Dog? I've done three interviews with him, and uh, you know, I mean, the guy was from Baltimore. Uh, you know, and he's from New, he's from, I'm, from, I'm sorry, uh, he's from Brooklyn. Jersey, but I mean, he, you know, I mean, the uh, guy, New, or Long Island, right? No, no, New Jersey, Jersey, yeah. yeah, no, right across the bridge, yeah, yeah, no, and he, uh, you know, very influenced by Ralph Rinsler and, and these cats, and 
uh, made these cross-country pilgrimages, but he specialized in the mandolin. But you play the mandolin too, don't you? I'm a hack on the mandolin, but but I do play now in fifths a five-string tenor guitar, which is kind of my own idea. It's a tenor guitar with a low F string added, uh, a fifth below the normal low C string. But anyway, yeah, he no, plays I mean, the mandolin. Yeah, I play no. the mandolin a teeny bit. He has been a huge influence on me, not only just through our friendship in general and our mutual love of old instruments, but also musically. Uh, you know, we've had great fun together, just playing in living rooms and at little teeny gigs and at his festivals and stuff. And, well, you both uh, use the same word. He's a great guy. I mean, it's been yeah. a half a century now, you know, and we're still just great, great pals. We, uh, yeah, I just, we, we really have fun hanging out together. <laughs> I mean, you both use the same word. You were talking about the early 50s. He was talking about the early 60s. Uh, used the term vapid. The, there was a vapid time in music. And um, I'm curious about when you came out to the Bay Area, uh, there was, you know, can you talk about how you guys got a break out there? I mean, did you already have connections? Were you connected to uh, Bill Graham? Did you, I mean, were you privy to all the, the bluegrass music and the country music that was going on there? Who, how did you assimilate, uh, how did you get into that scene? So, we were, you know, in New York, right? And, and, and when you're in New York, you got to be tough and you got to, you know, if you're going somewhere, you don't make eye contact with anyone. You walk real purposely and you just <laughs> let everybody on the street know that it would be a really bad idea to screw with you. Right, at all. right. Tough guy. That's where you're going yeah. and you do your rehearsal and then you go home mm -hmm. and you have dinner and then you do the same thing. You get to your gig, you play your gig, and you, you know, that's New York. And uh, the audiences are tough and everything's tough. <laughs> it's hard edge. So we come out to California for the first time in 19, late 1966. Whoa, everybody loves us. We can do no wrong. Every note we play, they think it's terrific. We, you know, so we play better, we sing better. We, and, uh, God, you know, there's free pot, there's beautiful women, there's just flowers, there's, you know, wonderful scene. So we have a few gigs, a couple of gigs in the Bay Area, a couple of gigs in the L.A. area. We go back to New York, you know, continue playing the go-go, continue going to Baltimore, going to all these, you know, Philadelphia, all these places. And uh, then we go back to California again a second time, you know. Whoa, the same thing. And now they know us a little bit. It's even better. We're playing the Avalon. We're playing the Fillmore. We, instead of, you know, first time it was the Matrix and these little clubs and whatnot. Now we're playing the bigger venues and playing along, you know, co-billing with the airplane and the dead and Quicksilver and the Big Brother and all this stuff. And, uh, whoa, man, this is great. And making good money, too. Mm -hmm. Go back to New York. You know, think that's where a manager is. That's where everything is, you know. Uh, so the third time... We went back to New York and said, wait a second. How come we keep going back to New York? <laughs> the vibe is so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Why don't we just move to California? You know, that mm -hmm. seems like that's where the action is. That's where the gigs are. And, you know, the contract's up with RCA. We're getting, looks like we're going to have a contract with Warner Brothers out in California. So, um, yeah, let's do it. So Jerry and Jesse kind of assumed, yeah, let's go with Hollywood and Vine. Meanwhile, Joe's brother was living in Olima, out here in West Marin, and I had grown up coming out here to West Marin a, a lot all my all my life as a kid and as a as a teen. And uh, so we and we actually had more work in the Bay Area than there was in the L.A. area. Granted, the studios were in L.A., but the the real scene was in the Bay Area. And uh, so Joe and I showed Jerry and Jesse. Inverness and Tomales Bay and West Marin and pointed out that it was just an hour from the city and another half hour from the airport to, you know, wherever we needed to go on tours. And they looked at it and said, whoa, sure, yeah. So we moved to West Marin, and then we all started to, you know, raise family. We were all married and all started to have kids and raise families out here. And um, so consequently, we... Um, and we had gigs, you know, we would go fly back east and do tours and fly to the Midwest and do tours and fly to the Southeast and do tours and then do all these gigs in the city. 
when it was time to do a gig in the city, say at the Avalon, and maybe there would be, you know, us and Big Brother and Blue Cheer and who knows what else playing there that night, and we were going to go on at 11. Well, we'd have dinner and then drive into the city, get there, you know, about 10, a quarter to 10 or something, and get the instruments that roadies, meanwhile, have got all the shit set up on, on stage ready to be pushed up when the other band strikes their stuff, and... Uh, so we do, all we need to do is just get the stuff out and maybe change our shirt and tune up and warm up a little bit and then play the set. And it's really cool and there's a great light show and the audience is all stoned and everybody's cool and, you know, play a great set, come back, you know, cool off a little bit and go back to West Marin. <laughs> did, did, I have did, never set foot in the Jefferson Airplane House or the Grateful Dead House or the whatever the other houses are with all their guns and their drugs and their sex and their excitement and their... Uh, adventures and whatnot. I raised seven kids out here in West Marin. I was in the PTA. I was the president of the Inverness Association. I, you know, sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, no, listen. I, I guess the um, the the better question really is: Can you talk about uh, the most interesting? Uh, did you guys play the Fillmore District? Did you play the Red Balloon? Did you play North Beach? Did you play? I guess what I'm getting at also is this idea, like you talk about the psychedelic bands, but I know you, ha you know, you guys were, you know, back with Dan Hicks, you guys were jazzers, you know, you're trying to play jazz, and there were so many, there was so much, such a sophisticated beauty. I mean, you had a sort of a more square Brubeck jazz scene, and then you had more of the Dewey Redmond, uh, you know, sort of uh, Ornette Coleman Happy House, uh, uh, and then you had the organ trios, and I just. I want to know about Banana. I know I know you're you're an upstanding PTA guy, but you, I just want to know if you went down to the the Fillmore and and uh, where where you the oddest venues that 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 you ever played in and the and the, and the closest you ever came to playing a Stone Jazz gig once you moved out there. Yeah, I've never I have never ever played a Stone Jazz. Actually, well, I guess I've kind of played a couple of Stone Jazz gigs with Martin Fierro. Let's hear a zero. Uh, it's from zero. It, no, just with Martin with the Martin Fierro quintet. Oh, um, who was in that? I band? don't know. Who I guess maybe you could consider Zero as sort of jazz. No, yeah, no, sure no, no, no. The, the, who was in the quintet? But, yeah, but Martin Fierro. That, there, that was just again jazz standards, and I, you know, I could just barely cut it. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I haven't spent a lot of time practicing jazz or learning all the substitutions inside out in my head and all that stuff. I've, I've kind of gravitated more towards the blues and folk and R and B and rock and all that. Who was in that? Who was in that band? Tree and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but and then, but in terms of, uh, you know, going to all these clubs and stuff again, I did, we just didn't do that much unless we had a gig. I didn't uh, go hang out in the music scene or explore the music scene. I like to listen to the radio and play, rec you know, get cool records and stuff and play at home. But uh, the, the club scenes and stuff. Uh, never real. Just didn't agree with me. I'd rather be out here in the country. Uh, oh, I dig. I dig. Practicing or um, gardening or <laughs> whatever, but all the music does. You know, the, the the music that comes out of that stuff sure does, and uh, and some of the places we've played have been pretty weird. I don't know. I mean, the weird you, that you there's different kinds of weird. The weirdest ones are those, you know, Las Vegas or Tahoe places where there's mafia guards all around, and <laughs> if you take a long turn, you could be dead, or if you're 30 <laughs> seconds late to the stage, you could be dead. That's weird. <laughs> um, talking to uh, Lowell Levenger, banana um, out in the country um, of Marin, West Marin. Um, one of the L's on my show is love. I'd like to know your concept of love and how you, you've cl clearly been a, a huge procreator of children. But beside that, what is your concept of love and how do you bring love to the world? Uh, well, I try to bring love to the world through my music and I've also made a video that I think is that I hope will, will help bring love to the world, and it's based on the song Get Together, with, which is certainly a love anthem that mm -hmm. has reached an awful lot of people, uh, and I'm really proud to have been you know, part of that seminal recording, and the recording that I made of it a couple of years ago with my grand chorus of angels composed of all my friends, Maria and Dan and Dog and David Nelson and all these other folks, I think is a excellent re-recording of it, and I've got a video that was made based on it that David's daughter Jillian produced and his grandson Miles shot, uh, and it's at my website, 
www.lowellevenger.com. Just go there right right away. There it is. And accompanying it is a letter that you can paraphrase or just take on its own that uh, I'm suggesting be sent to your congressional representatives, which encourages them to take the message of the video and the song to heart and to try to cooperate with each other and see the good with each other and actually maybe try to love each other instead of being stalemated like this. And in the letter, I actually have included some quotes from who a lot of these folks say is their favorite all-time guy, Jesus, from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, where he is saying, love one another. That's exactly what he's saying. And it's not a suggestion that he's making. It's actually a commandment. How about that? Mm. Can you talk about a time in your career or in your life where you faced adversity and how you overcame it? Um, well, of course, death appears as an adversity because the loss is so great. And uh, mm. I've faced that a few times. Um, the most uh, uh, dramatic or the most, uh, the one that has probably affected me the most, although Joe sure affected me a lot, but my son, when I lost my son, that was, I guess, maybe the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And um, I overcame it by playing music. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't have gone, you know, and played music at gigs the following, throughout the following month, where that's where you're able to pour your heart out. You know? Did did you? Uh, did, you did, could cry too. That helps. Well, but, no. I, I mean, this is this is important because you 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 would. You talked before about the Old Testament, New Testament. Um, can you did were you surrounded by love at that time, not just from your immediate family, but from your cohorts as well? Oh boy, no kidding. Yeah. And also when my I another one of my sons was really really sick uh, when he was a, an infant, and and uh, we were in the, my wife and I traded off being in the hospital for months and months and months. Uh, we never you know never left the side and. When my oldest daughter had a nervous breakdown over it, it was a huge, stressful time in my life. And again, the support that we got from uh, the musical community and then also our local community here in West Marin was incredible. So, you know, there's some, through all this adversity, uh, that's where uh, love is, is shown often, where, where it's exhibited in its uh, most glorious forms um in about a minute if you could just talk um as a, a leader uh in the 20 in 2016 what are some leadership leadership qualities some nuanced leadership qualities that are, are going to be invaluable for younger uh artists and just younger people uh curiosity uh willingness to accept the duality of things. Uh, what they should do is, <laughs> I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but those are a couple. Uh, and and uh, humility and um, yeah, willingness to embrace different points of view. These seven qualities, you can Google the seven qualities of Leonardo da Vinci. And there it all is in a nutshell. And those, I just named three or four of them there. I, I should have them all off the top of my head in Italian, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you have you have anything that? Uh, that but that's what I would that's yeah. what I would encourage people to do is go Google the seven qualities of Leonardo da Vinci and try to try to take all of them to heart. Well, low that's level health, curiosity, yeah. health, uh, willingness to embrace other ideas, willingness to accept duality. That's four. Oh well. Anyway. Oh well. Listen, Lowell, I, I, I look forward to picking up and doing part two. We got more to do, but I really had a ball with you, man. Thank you so much. All right. My pleasure, man. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Keep up the good work. Thank you, brother. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. That's a wrap. Thanks to Mike Roper. We'll be back next week. Peace. I don't know.